everything was stopped. Hello, good day. I am Red Hawk, and we are hanging at the deep end. You know, today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about tomorrow. When I was a kid in, the, in 11th grade, everybody went and saw the counselor. And I've probably told this story before, but it, it's redemptive for me to tell it. So I go to see the counselor, and I sit down in front of the counselor's desk, and she says, you can go sit on the bench outside the offices. You have no future. And I went, what? And she goes, you've been nothing but trouble. We, I imagine you'll continue to be trouble. So I went and didn't sit on any bench. I went home. When I got home, my mom says, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I don't have a future, so what the hell is the point? And my mom said, you sit right there, damn it. And she went up into the, to the school, and an hour later she came back and she said, uh, tomorrow you go to school and you have a future. See, that's, sometimes it's hard to be hopeful of if we have a future or not. <laughs> there for a minute I wasn't sure about myself. And I'll be honest, I never had a planned future. I just started asking questions and it led me one thing to another. And it's been hopeful. You know, Brett Spiner, who, Spiner, who played uh, Data on Star Trek The Next Generation, was interviewed and said, what's the whole point of this, uh, you know, Star Trek? And he said, the main point is that we have a future. And I really like that, that, that we have something to reach for even beyond all the stuff we're hung up in. And the stuff we're hung up in doesn't go away, it just moves to a new order. And I remind you that the very first Star Wars that was produced, the name of it was A New Hope. And of course, we don't know what The New Hope is until we get to the first three uh, episodes, which are tedious at best. And we do see A New Hope. Hope. What is it? Hope is defined as an optimistic state of mind that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events and circumstances in one's life or at the world at large. And if, if we really look at uh, the psychology of hope, we find, and Barbara Fredrickson has done some, some great research in this, argues that hope comes into its own when crisis looms, opening us to new creative possibilities. She argues that the great need, with the great need, comes an unusually wide range of ideas, as well as positive emotions such as happiness and joy, courage and empowerment. And we are called to bring the cognitive, the psychological, the social, and the physical all together in some new envisioning. And so hope itself what causes it is cause for creative thinking. And I love Emily Dickinson when she talks about hope, uh, which I'll be honest, I, I go to Emily all the time because how can I not? Um, she says, hope is the thing with feathers that perches on the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in eternity it asked a crumb of me. Over and over we see, Eugene O'Neill said, human hope is the greatest power in life and the only thing that defeats death. Hope, what is it? What we can say is hope is a positive emotion. In uh uh, Valence, spiritual evolution, he says that hope reflects the capacity for one's loving, lyrical, limbic memory of the past to become attached to a memory of the future. And this capacity occurs within. It evolves from the frontal lobes, but it's expansion of the frontal lobes. It does something to us. And we're starting to understand the neurology of hope, which is quite amazing in my eyes. And what I can say without a doubt is those who are hopeless, who don't have hope, usually just lack creativity. 
Uh, and I think that's what's great about a lot of sci-fi and a lot of the, the shows that we, we see is they are trying to get us to be hopeful. But it's important to see what is not hope. It's important that we see that uh, th there's a distinguished difference between a wish and hope. Wishes, as a, a neurologist says, wishes are words from the left brain. Hope is made up of images that are rooted in the right brain. Hope requires enormous effort. Hope reflects our ability to imagine a realistic, positive future. See, hope is this aspect of who we are, of how we are. And how behavior really, really has 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 a huge um, impact on us. And when we the studies of hope, when you really look at it, you see that it really comes from your family of origin, how you were cared for, and and the way you were uh, lifted up or let down, and how those those processes work. You know, and I've shared this story before, I know, about the rats who were put in water, and right before they drowned, they were saved. And then weeks later, they put those rats in the water again with rats that had never been in the water or saved, and the rats that had been saved swam twice as long because they had a memory of a future. I'm often thinking about our garden. We have our garden and we love it. Every year we planted it and it would grow unbelievable veggies and flowers year after year. And last year, squat. But we remember the future and we had hope. So those itty bitty tomatoes we had, <laughs> they were extra delicious because they were filled with hope as well. But the garden did pitiful. But I got to see hope in action, a memory of the future. And if we look at the cycle of civilization, and my first real contact with this is the Foundation Trilogy and Hebrew Scriptures. That's where they come from. But it's this process of being humbled and then using that humility to reconnect yourself to the real until the point where you become so connected that you become prideful and full of hubris and something then brings you down and you become humble again. So there's this cycle. If you look at human civilization between humility and pride over and over and over again, uh, many people don't realize it, but uh, the people who lost the most people during the Second World War were the Chinese. And they're kind of not spoken of, but the Chinese were humble in a way that I can, I, I can barely touch. And how that humility has built them from the ground up into a people of great power uh, of economic and military wealth. So hope. Today we're talk talking about hope, what hope is, and how we have hope for tomorrow. And I have to say, um, I'm hopeful. I'm not hopeful that in my lifetime things are going to find a resolve, but I'm hopeful that in my lifetime the cycle of civilization will play out and that human beings in the integrity and the moral sense and the uh, uh, golden rule-ish aspect of, of the human family uh, will keep coming around and reiterating itself in such a way that we can embrace it and expand uh, our awareness to new orders of understanding uh, and hopefulness. So I just laid out a bunch of stuff. We only have a half hour. Uh, uh, and I want us to be very positive today. Sometimes it's hard not to be uh, positive, but we're talking about a positive emotion. And uh, that positive emotion uh, is hope. And I do believe that uh, hope is the only thing that can make a stand against death. Uh, and that's a powerful statement to say. But I don't believe that viruses and climate change and uh, nuclear uh, warfare are going to bring an end to the human family. I think it will bring the fam human family to its knees to humility once again, to facing the real and the true uh, at, a, at a new order. 
and then we will find a new way of uh, understanding things. And maybe this is what AI is about. I don't know. A lot of people are not very hopeful about AI. So um, I'm going to start with Marianne. Marianne, what say you when it comes to this um, funky little bird that uh, never stops tweeting called Hope? Well, um, I can tell you that I am here today sitting here talking with you and Bob and to all of our listeners only because of hope. Um, hope is what got me through some really, really tough, tough times. And I, I think of it as an antidote to despair because <coughs> when we're in circumstances, when, when things are happening in the world and we see the the overwhelming sorrow and suffering that's out there, it's really hard to um, to not let that take us down. And I love when you talked about wishing and hoping and wishing being, you know, like a left brain activity and hope being more of the images and the creative part of it. And um, And I think that is is so um, important because we have to be able to entertain the possibility that something will change, that things will be different, that they can get better. And even if we can just let that in, that's enough, a little bit of hope to take us through those dark times, knowing that everything changes, um, nothing stays the same. And I think that, um, it's, um, you know, there's a there's a saying that um, everything will be okay in the end, and that's very hopeful. And if it's not okay, that just means it's not the end. And so, is that delusional or is that hope at work? And to me, I think that's hope at work. Um, that we hold on to something that is greater than what we have right now, and know that that possibility exists. Amen. Yeah. And you said something very important that I want us to keep in mind, and that is despair is the opposite of hope. And uh, that uh, if, if we don't see the change in us in terms of how we behave, how we put into the world and touch the world and how it touches us, then we're not going to see hope. Because we can only see hope at the same level we can see the change in ourselves and our activity in that change in terms of our interaction with the world. Um, and so, amen, sister. Uh, it's, it's a shame that change is such a big part of it, but it's also a blessing that change is such a big part of it. <laughs> Bob, what say you? Uh, well, I, I think that there's an important distinction to be made between generalized hope and specific hope. And generalized hope is kind of what you were saying about the world is going to turn out all right. Things are going to be okay in the end. We may or may not see it, but we're moving in the right direction and so forth. And I think that's important for our general psychological well-being. But I think there's also specific hopes, and that is what we can link with actions. If we don't believe that our actions will lead to something hopefully better than than where we are, then we're not motivated to take those actions. But when you link hope and action, the outcomes, and these have been shown in a, in a variety of different studies, are much more positive. Students who, who are hopeful that they're going to get a good education and link that with studying do better. Uh, athletes who are hopeful that they're going to improve their times in a certain event and and link that with with intense practice are more likely to perform better than than other athletes so we we have that generalized hope that sort of keeps us in the game and then the specific hope that lets us move through specific events in our lives I love that you connected that to our actions and our individual actions, because that's really important. It's like if you didn't go out and replant that garden, it wasn't going to grow. 
even though it didn't grow one year. You know, you have to take those steps. Amen. By the yeah. way, it's looking really good. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, something about the, you know, we're talking about hope for tomorrow. So I don't know if that's general or specific. But uh, those who have a general sense of hope live longer. And the studies have borne that out over and over uh, that, uh, you know, hope, the way I've always said it is hope is an expectation with an agenda. And uh, uh, the agenda to me um, exists in two or three generations up. That's where I, I try to see how our actions are really affecting. And uh, I think that the, that the more we start lengthening our point of view, uh, the better we're going to be and the, the better our tomorrow is. But what we're talking about is hope is aspiration. Aspirating, aspiration for a tomorrow that is better. And I think that, that every hope is grounded in some iteration of that, whether it's running or engineering, uh, it's if you have a project or whether it's tomorrow, that we want to do better. We want it to be a couple clicks uh, more fair. Uh, you know. And we've talked a whole lot about the golden rule on this podcast and how it's there in every religion. And it's almost like you know we started with a, a Star Trek piece a little bit. And I want to say that you know the prime directive of planet Earth is the golden rule to do unto others as we would have them do to us. It's there, it surfaced in every religion. There's something about this justice piece. And I'm convinced that any hope for our future, for our tomorrow, has to include and be centered in some fundamental way on the justice piece. Um, yeah, I think... You know, we have to we have to believe that our lot in life can be improved and that others can be it can we can improve. And that's where that justice comes in. You know, justice for all. Yeah. Yeah. It, it forms a positive uh, a, a positive feedback loop. The more hopeful we are, the more we act on that hope the more events lead us to reinforce that hopefulness. And we, we, if we can keep that positive feedback loop going and, and use, you, you, you said hope is, is uh, aspirational. Well, it's also inspirational because without hope, we're not inspired to take those actions that Marianne was referring to earlier that we need to take to, to move ourselves and, and, and civilization forward. So it, it's, I'm hopeful that those positive feedback loops will become stronger and stronger as we move uh, into the future. And you, you bring an important piece up uh, because uh, th there's a difference between uh, wishful and committed hope. Wishful hope is basically just on dis based on distorted realities. And this is the piece that we have to understand, that if you distort reality, any sense of hope will not be able to root itself properly. Uh, and uh, an accurate view of the real is integral for us to imagine a future uh, that, is, that is more hopeful. You know, as the, as the Mariners were playing, the, the, the couple of last series, one was the Yankees and the other was uh, uh, the Rangers. Every inning, I'd say to Edie, I'm becoming less hopeful. <laughs> And there was no, there was a point where uh, I, I didn't have false hope. I had no hope. I had lost hope. And I think that that's also a piece of this that's real. Not um, having no hope, but having had hope and losing it. And I think that's a piece that, at least for me, I have gone through over and over in some uh, fundamental ways in my life. Uh, and Marianne, you were making an expression there. I know that you've probably gone through that cycle at the level of the real a few times. Well, you know, that's so interesting because as you were saying that, it, it's like, yes, um, you have to still face reality. And at some point, no matter how much you hope that 
your Mariners are going to win. There comes a, a point where that doesn't happen. And so how do you, how do you rekindle your hope for the next game, right? How do you get back into that? And you're right, in my life, it was, I had a lot of hope for outcomes different than what happened. But at some point, I had to face the reality that, okay, that's not, I'll tell you a little story about when my, when my daughter was passing, right up until the very end, I continued to hope that anything was possible, that miracles can happen, that things could turn around. I've read stories, I've heard stories about this. And then there was one moment where I had to shift my hope. I had to come to a place of, I just don't want this suffering to go on. And so my hope turned to the end of suffering versus the um, continuation of life. And so there, that was hope being hit with the reality of what's happening and still being able to shift and carry me to the next moment. And it was really important. Yeah. And, and what you've just done is made a connection. And the connection is basically hope is not cognitive. Hope is part of our emotional mammalian heritage. And Eric Erickson said that uh, it's the, the, the most indispensable virtue. And what you just showed us is how hope, rooted in reality, has to translate to trust and how trust translates to faith. And faith is the bigger order in which hope is dancing within, in my mind. Uh, so I think that connection is very, very important. And uh, thanks for that, because that's that was helpful to me in all my little uh, lost hopes, if you will. Uh, and they seem very little in comparison. <laughs> well, it, sh it it can shift, and I think that's that's really important. Yes. Yeah, I think that is really important, and that's that's... Part of the, the, the nature of humanity is the ability to make those shifts, to, to not get bogged down in one order of hope, but to be able to shift it so that, again, it, it then inspires you to, to move in that other direction. And, and that's, that's something that, that is, I slightly disagree with, 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 with Red Hawk. I think there is a cognitive aspect to it. Because I think you have to begin to realize what reality is in order to make that shift. Well, I'm not suggesting it's it, there's not a cognitive aspect to it. I'm suggesting that the root of it is not cognitive, that it comes from something else. The cognitive attends it, and that's the key to me. I mean, Mary Ann just showed how she, you know, the cognitive attended, uh, you know, hope. So uh, I'm saying that the rootedness of it is is from a different part of the brain and then the front brain of course tends it um so uh, oh. yeah the whole concept well, you know, go ahead marianne well i was going to say you know the other the other part of this too is hope doesn't necessarily deal with the outcomes hope is um i i think it's um and and having faith and trust are very much linked to that and love, you know, and, and having faith and trust in that. And that um, when we hold on, when we don't get the outcome that we want, that's when we can lose hope. Right. Um, and that's where that's what we have to let go of. We let go of those expectations and those outcomes. Amen. And then that's when we can find hope again. And it sustains us. Yeah. And I think you, you, we do need to address hopelessness. If we look at clinical depression, it's basically in my mind and in many psychologists and therapists and neurologists mind, uh, depression is really a, a place where we have lost touch with the rootedness of this aspect of, of who we are, which is hope, which is, you know, it, I can't look at hope without seeing the golden rule because any hope for tomorrow 
means a, a better expression, a more sensitively nuanced uh, understanding, and a, uh, systems that more clearly reflect uh, empathy so that we can uh, be more a part of each other and understand each other even when we disagree. Uh, so I think that's very, very Im important uh, to, to understand. And if you're depressed, man, get some help. Seriously. Uh, there are so many therapists out there. Maybe you have to go to three th ther therapists before you find one. I know that Edie and I did, but when we found one, wow. Boy, talk about life changes. Talk about an internal universe shifting. That was hopeful. That showed me that real change is available if we dare to attend it. I think so many people are just, they're so pr proudful they, they won't go to, to a therapist. Or, uh, you know, even our kid we sent to a therapist. <laughs> because, man, if I was just going to start punching him in the face. And I didn't want to do that. So uh, <laughs> we sent him to a therapist. It became hopeful. And the language that we talked about things changed. So we, we've talked a whole lot uh, about, about hope, and we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, hope for tomorrow, uh, for a world that really is more fair uh, and, and, and judicious, if you will. Uh, so, Bob, final comments? Well, I, I think we all agree and have tried to articulate in our own ways how important hope is. And, you know, this, this idea of, of hope for the future, of the generalized idea of hope and the specific hope for, for our lives and, and making ourselves better positioned to have a, a happier life and so forth, I think we're, we're constantly bouncing between the two of those. And I think it's the generalized hope that keeps everything moving. It, it's, it's like the, I'm, I'm, I don't know how good the metaphor is, but it, it, it struck me a couple of minutes ago that, that uh, generalized hope is like a guitar. And specific hopes are like the strings that you're plucking on the guitar. And you have to move from one to the other. But it's that generalized structure of the, of the guitar that allows you to make those specific notes arise. So you, you, can't, you can't get by without both of them uh, playing together. And uh, it's the ability to make those shifts that allows us to create music, if I can extend that metaphor. Amen. Marianne, final I, comments? I love, I love that metaphor. And, and it's like the specifics within the structure. And ultimately, you're making music, right? You're living your life. And, um, you know, I think one of, one of the things I really think that I, I want to bring up is sadness is also a very much a part of, of life. And Amen. that just because you're sad doesn't mean you've lost hope. Um, when you sink into despair, and there are going to be moments when you when that happens, depending on what's going on in your life, and that's okay if you can just start to imagine the possibility that it can change, and that's where hope can get an opening. And don't give up; um, just keep going. That's my final word. Amen. And I think you 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 bring up a, a word that is integral to the whole thing, and that's imagination. Uh, uh, and I said earlier that uh, I thought that that uh, those who were hopeless were just not creative. Uh, and that's why I'm glad for a lot of the, the TV shows, because people don't read anymore. And that's where hope used to come from, books. Uh, and, you know, in Pandora's box, when that was opened, all these evil, fiendish thingies came out. But the very last thing that came out was hope was hope. And I, I want us to keep that in mind. And Mary Ann hooked us up how hope and trust and faith are so connected. And uh, Wilford Canton Smith wrote one time that the paleo in, since Paleolithic times, by far, the overwhelming majority of human beings on this planet have been men and women of faith. Faith. Wow, what the hell is faith, man? You know, people, atheists act like because they've given up God, they, they don't have faith anymore. And they go, what? What are you talking about? Come on. 
faith, man. Faith. Faith is something that causes us to reach, to reach something reasonable from an unreasonable place. Sometimes faith is just a context of con contentment so that you can be at home even at the side of your dying daughter. And how do you do that? That doesn't mean you don't feel sad. That doesn't mean you don't have overwhelming uh, emotions, but it means that you're present in all that. And you know that it's holy, it's sacred, and it connects you in a way that is profound. Faith, I'm convinced, faith is one of the great connectors. Till next time, may all of us, all of us, find more hope for tomorrow.